linguistik <tuh> kelas daring linguistik uh, MLI pada hari ini 20 November 2020. Tema kita hari ini tentang uh, fonetik dan bagaimana menggunakan kat untuk mengukur uh, vokal deret tiga begitu ya nanti uh, lebih jelas uh, akan disampaikan oleh Bear. Uh, sebelum kita mulai izinkan saya untuk memperkenalkan narasumber kita pada hari ini. Beliau adalah uh, Bear Remisen ya mudah-mudahan saya betul mengeja namanya. Uh, mendapatkan gelar Master of Art dalam bidang linguistik dari Universitas Leiden, kemudian PhD juga dalam bidang linguistik dari Universitas yang sama. Uh, Disertasi Pak Ber tentang Word Prosodic Systems of Raja Ampat Languages. Kemudian beliau menjadi Post uh, doctoral researcher di uh, Leiden tahun 2002 sampai 2005, lanjut di uh, University of Edinburgh dari tahun 2005 sampai 2012. Kemudian beliau menjadi dosen di Universitas Edinburgh dari tahun 2017. Publikasi uh, beliau sangat banyak. Uh, saya hanya bacakan dua yang terkini. Uh, sebagian besar dalam bidang phonetics dan phonology. Ada dua uh, karya dalam ta uh, pada tahun 2020. Yang pertama, Form of Functions in the Spatial Axis Derivation of Silube Transitive Verb. Ini uh, adalah publikasi khusus dalam bentuk bab di uh, Grammar of Silube. Begitu. Kemudian publikasi kedua tahun 2020 berjudul Floating Quantity in Siluk dalam jurnal Language. Uh, Bapak Ibu untuk keahlian uh, Pak Ber itu di uh, fieldwork tentu saja metode acoustic analysis, controlled elicitation, qualitative analysis of phonological and morphosyntactic data, experimental design, and statistical analysis. Software yang beliau kuasai, Prat, R, dan SPSS. Nah, itu uh, tentang narasumber kita hari ini. Kemudian, uh, Pak Ber dan Bapak Ibu, the audience for today spread all over Indonesia from Sumatra till uh, Papua. So there are about 89 participants um, in this class there, and uh, some of them are professors. So let me uh, please greet our uh, professor uh, attending this uh, lecture today, Professor Nadra, Professor Sulis, Professor Effendi Kadarisman, dan Professor Barus. And other audience are students, lecturer, or uh, researcher in linguistics. Okay, Bert, I think uh, that's uh, for the introduction and also great welcome to all participants uh, for joining uh, our class today. And now time is yours, Bert. You have like one until one and a half hours for presentation. Please, uh, the room is yours. Well, Anik, thank you so much for introducing me. That's very kind. And uh, yeah, I want to uh, explain express my uh, to my feeling of being honored to have this opportunity to present to you uh, this, well, I want to say this morning, well, this day, let's say, just uh, to keep it, um, keep it straight. Um, yeah, uh, I think that overall in the perspective on the study of sound systems, one approach that one can take is one can explore what is possible in human languages through the study of uh, of experiment uh, by carrying out experiments that is that is a source of information as as to what is possible and another source of information is to see what is out there what is the range of the possible that we find in in human languages and that's what we call of course typology and uh, um i think the, the focus of my work has really been on approaching that question of what is possible in the world's languages by four, well, I've been concentrating on that question in relation to suprasegmentals. And uh, in, 
and then it is worthwhile to look for languages that push the envelope yeah that are that, that show us the the edge of what is possible and to kind of kind of see what what is yeah a, examine them in detail um sometimes we find that there is a tension between what the th what the theory says and what the typology says yeah and then it is worthwhile to see well the, the, then the, the then the phenomena offer an opportunity to 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 evaluate a theory in any case let me uh i'll, I'll share screen now so that you can um yeah uh so as to go to my presentation and i'll uh yeah and so this presentation is um uh, is, is is available to you and if you at some point would want for example sound examples that i use here then i'm then i'm happy to happy to to uh to provide those right i'll put this to the side um good um so so my my title is on ternary vowel length and um so ternary vowel length uh let me start with um with a uh, with a definition so this uh, ternary or, or three level uh, vowel length um, refers to a phonological distinction between short, long and overlong vowels in which, and that is primarily realized through vowel duration. Uh, and crucially, this contrast of vowel duration is within the syllable nucleus. Um, it is within within a, a single syllable. Now, many languages, uh, Arabic comes to mind, uh, Japanese co uh, comes to mind, uh, Finnish. Those are all languages that have a contrast between short and long vowels. But there is a, a small number of languages for which it has been claimed that we can have not just two, but also a third level of, uh, of vowel length. And so that is that is the focus of this uh, research. And so in my transcription, um, well, one way to transcribe this is by the IPA uh, characters of, uh, of half long uh, and long. Well, sometimes it's all, what I also see is people use sh uh, this for short and then this for long and then two IPA characters for long for the overlong ones. That's another option. What I'm using and what you'll see in my presentation is simply the the doubling and the tripling of the vowel character. But please keep in mind that uh, I'm uh, using this in the context of these being in the same syllable. That is the uh, the important part. Right. So yeah, th there are several studies where you can read. Uh, also quite recently that um, vowel length is by its nature a binary contrast. Now in phonology, binarity is a cherished concept. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this thing of binary branching is, is a very attractive idea. And so in that sense, uh, if languages can have contrast three levels of vowel length, well, then that's a problem, yeah? So, uh, or, or th then there's the issue of, of how to address it. And anyway, let me go back to the earlier literature. There are two surveys that consider hypothesized cases of uh, three level vowel length. And there is, for example, a case in nor a Northern variety of German that has uh, a, hypothesis, a hypothesized case. That's one that uh, Kohler investigated. And so, but he said, well, actually, no, there are just two levels of voweling there. And the third level is one of, um, uh, it is actually a difference in vowel quality. So um, it's, yeah, so that's, that's so what, so Odin and, and Preen, they conclude that actually most of these cases where three level voweling has been postulated, we don't need it. We can actually, explain it better by, by by saying there are just two levels of vowel length and the third thing is for example a, di uh, a difference in vowel quality but both of these uh, both of these sources find one language or report one language where they find the evidence uh, compelling and that is dinka dinka is spoken in south sudan um and 
this is and i will show you some some data from dinka to show you how how the system uh, works there but and D dinka is um so here you have a map of uh, of south sudan and i mean south sudan is landlocked so it's not so easy to make sense of it but notice here is ethiopia here is kenya uganda congo and this is south sudan it's an independent country for now since um since 2009 and the biggest language in south sudan is dinka uh, and uh, you see it here um and then you have uh, other yeah what you see here marked on this map these are all uh, the West Nilotic languages. So it is not the case that around it, here in the white area, that there are no humans. Uh, it is just that they primarily speak other languages, uh, the, the Niger Congo languages, uh, other groups of Nilo Saharan. But these are uh, the West Nilotic ones. And so here is Dinka. And then, uh, yeah. And you see that, that that the Nilotic languages, West Nilotic, doesn't form one contiguous family. So, for example, here, this one is in an island of, uh, of unrelated languages. Anyway, right. So uh, what I will what I will do is I'll, I'll first uh, show you something about three level vowel length in Dinka, then move on to considering the same phenomenon in Shiluk. Um, uh, yeah, the, where the phenomenon hadn't been studied before. And then finally, uh, I, I, I got a sense that there was interest in um, getting some explanation about the use of Prat. So I will do that at, 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 the, yeah, at the most basic level, but I've also created an exercise and that exercise is, um, is available. I, I don't know um, whether it's, accessible on the on the website but if it's if it's not then yeah either either through uh um uh either through dr mayani or or straight with me you're you're welcome to uh to, to ask for those materials and that and that is really step-by-step -step introduction in how you use prat and i will so i will go through the basics um at after the uh presenting you the the research on three level vowel length and then uh, then i think because the, the the way yeah acoustic phonetics is a is a do thing is something you you learn by practice so that's uh that's what i would then recommend to uh to uh, to do that exercise but let me start now with three level vowel length in um, in dinka and in shiluk so shiluk is also spoken in this area also in south sudan and you see it you see it here uh, i think when you look at the, where these languages are on the map it doesn't quite make sense they're just blobs there but the the key issue here is i mean if this were indonesia we would see islands if this is this being south sudan the key thing is the river nile yeah Water is life, and in um, South Sudan, oops, let me, uh, the, the Nile actually runs, um, um, yeah, runs here, makes a bend through, is, forms the border between uh, uh, Shiluk and, uh, and Dinka territory. Anyway, um, yeah, oh yeah, and Shiluk is a kingdom, actually, so, um, anyway, now to, to matters linguistic. So, um, in the study of vowel length, it is it is well established that many languages that historically did not have a vowel length contrast, that the way they developed it was through compensatory lengthening. What does that mean? Well, imagine here a, a language that has uh, CVC syllables and it has uh, suffixes. Then at some point, what it might do is it might lose the suffix and compens and lengthen the vowel in compensation. That may sound completely arbitrary. Why would the quantity move like that? It makes it makes phonological sense you that you retain it. But keep in mind how in a phonetic sense, we know that open syllables are longer than closed syllables. Yeah. So if I if I say something like mum, that vowel will be shorter 
than when I say uh, something like mama. Yeah. So uh, when a vowel is open, then uh, is in, excuse me, when a vowel is in an open syllable, then, it will, then it will have a greater duration. So the, so what that means is that the vowel of the first syllable already has a greater duration before the second one is lost. Yeah, so this, so that is where it comes from. It's not that, that the quantity magically changes over. It's more that by there being a, a final vowel, this consonant re syllabifies with this vowel and as a consonant, as, and as a consequence, this vowel is longer already to begin with before this vowel is lost. But then this vowel is lost. And actually, we don't have to go far uh, to, uh, to see evidence of this because think of the English word tail. There actually was a time when tail was pronounced something like tala. Yeah. So sometimes learners of English, they're wondering, why do we write this word with two syllables? And the reason is there was a time when it was two syllables and English spelling is conservative. So once uh, uh, tail uh, was uh, had a long, excuse me, was the, had two syllables and that first syllable became lengthened because it was something like tale and then it became talo that that final vowel became schwa then that final vowel was dropped and we had a long vowel so that is compensatory lengthening um and a well-established study on this topic is the one by bruce hayes so uh in proto west nilotic where dinka and shiluk um, are both descendant descended from we had this type of thing happening with of compensatory lengthening but the crucial difference between the situation of tala becoming tal and the situation of west nilotic was that west nilotic already had long vowels so in west nilotic you had short vowels in the stem syllable you had long vowels in the stem syllable then compensatory lengthening uh, happened. And the effect of that was that the short, the syllables uh, with a short vowel that had a suffix, they became long. Then what happened with the syllables with a long vowel that had a suffix? Well, they became longer still. And they became overlong. And that is how we got the three levels of vowel length in um, in West Nilotic. And this is, uh, I'm referring here to work by uh, Torben Andersen. Right, now this contrast that we find then of three levels of vowel length, it is, it is typologically unusual and it's phonetically challenging. Uh, that is something that I did in a 2008 study on Dinka um, in Journal of Phonetics, where we, where we, re checked how close together are these levels of vowel length and they really um they, they are it is not that they are that the distinction is made greater than than with uh, languages that have a binary contrast yeah and in this context so how can we um there is this i think interesting perspective by juliet uh, blevins and she argues that most sound changes are are natural in a phonetic sense in the uh, in, a, in the sense that they are easy to they make the speech easier and they or they make this the speech easier to uh, to to perceive but she also says well there are some situations in which we get a sound change that actually leads to a very complex a more co challenging result auditorily for example and she says well that will like a sound change that is for example perceptually challenging it will still happen if it has the effect that we retain morphological contrast so imagine that that english at some point loses final s yeah 
according to Juliet Blevins as uh, analysis uh, or hypothesis, it would not be so weird if English would use a, a final S that has a lexical function, but retain final S when it's doing morphological work. Yeah. So box, the box in which we pack things might become a book, but works would keep its S. Yeah. That is the kind of idea of Juliet Blevins. We that if a certain contrast is doing work in the morphology, it is more likely to be retained. And, in, and that is how we can understand how this three-level vowel length happens in West Nilotic. Because in West Nilotic, these final vowels, they were um, distinguishing morphological forms. Um, so let me show you the data of uh, from Dinka. So I've just said this is what what we got. So in a paradigm that had a short vowel, then after the sound change, we get a contrast between short and long. And in a paradigm where we have uh, a long vowel, then we get alternations between long and overlong. It's going to be clearer when I show you some data. Here is the verb to isolate. And you see that in the second singular, it has um, it has a, a short vowel, and in the third singular, it has a long vowel. I can I will play this to you. I'll play it again. So you're paying attention for to the vowel in the in the final the the final syllable. So that is the second singular of this verb. Now, when we have the third singular of this verb, then we have a, a greater vowel length. Rana lil. I'll play one after Rana the other. Lil. Rana lil. Rana yeah. lil. And now consider this verb. This is, uh, uh, this is a, a different verb. This is the verb to provoke. And provoke has a long vowel. But in some inflections, it has an overlong vowel. So this is what I mentioned early, uh, on the previous slide. So we have um, verbs that alternate between short and long. And we have other verbs that alternate between long and overlong. Yeah. And so this is a verb that alternates between long and overlong. And then here we've got it in the third singular. I've, I've kept the, the inflections here the same. Now, these two forms here for the verb to provoke, they are different in tone because um, Dinka is a tone language, as are all the West Nilotic languages. But notice how what this, what this shows you is that if we put them together, if we put together the second singular of isolate with the third singular of isolate, with the third singular of provoke, then we have a three-way vowel length contrast, a ternary contrast. Yeah, I'll play them. Rana lil. Rana lil. Rana lil. Rana lil. Rana lil. Rana lil. One thing that you notice here, um, so the, the typical values in this language of the... Um, of this vowel length contrast, well, here you see them. So the short vowel will typically be somewhere around 60 or 70 milliseconds. Oh yes, so what I'm showing you here, uh, I've studied vowel length in Dinka in, 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 in yeah, several dialects. I started with the Luanjang dialect. Um, and uh, then later on, I, I also investigated Bor and Aiger. And so here you see the mean values. In each case, you see data for each of these dialects from at least eight people. So it's eight or nine or 10. And you see the mean and the standard deviation of the raw measures. So that means that, for example, in this dialect, in the Bohr dialect, you see here that, um, yeah, so, sorry, let me, approach it in a different way. Um, each of us, we speak at a different rate. 
Some people are slower, some people are faster. So um, that gives rise to variability in the data. That variability is in this data. So that the data have not been cleaned up for that, which means that the fact that we even without that cleaning up, we don't, and, and with cleaning up, I mean uh, using the Z transformation to normalize for between speaker differences. Even without doing that, you see that the, that the separation at the level of one standard deviation is fairly clean, yes? So 68% of the values across speakers uh, is within, for the overlong vowel. This, so these are the overlong ones. This is uh, long, this is short. And you see, crucially, they don't overlap. In Luanjang here, we do see, we do see a bit of overlap. Um, wh where does that come from? Well, one thing is, as I said, um, rate of speech between speaker variation in rate of speech. Another source is um, vowel height. Yeah, so uh, high vowels have shorter durations. But you, overall, the separations are, uh, are fairly clean. Notice how the, the, the importance of rate of speech. So I think that here in the Aguirre dialect, all of the speakers were speaking fairly fast. So even the long vowel, uh, even the overlong vowel is um, at, yeah, at, at about uh, 150 milliseconds. And then the short ones are, yeah, so um, are, are, are shorter still. Would one say that rate of speech can be a dialect feature? Well, I'm sure that, that the difference is significant, but I'm still think it might be just chance. I'm, I don't want to make anything of this. Um, so you, but the crucial thing here, so you see that this is, this is a fairly consistent contrast. Yeah. So in each of these dialects of this language, the, um, so the, 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 the effect that we have, um, uh, yeah. So the situation whereby, uh, any verbs either alternate between short and long, like we see here, or between long and overlong, that is that is very consistently the, the case th uh, throughout um, the language. Now, let's go look at this phenomenon in, in Shiluk. So, um, with, so well, or actually, if, let me stay for a moment with the phenomenon of, uh, with this phenomenon of, uh, of Dinka. So, this in relation to Dinka, this has been known for a long time or has been postulated for a long time. I didn't come up with this hypothesis. There is a 1987 paper by Torben Andersen, whom I cited earlier, uh, who says Dinka has three levels of vowel length. And um, um, I, I think one, but then there were also all these other languages for which it had been, had been claimed, like the Northern dialect of German. So the, this is where quantitative analysis, I find, can be very, can be very useful because we can, we can prove that something is there and that it is not based on our hearing. Yeah? And, and that, that value of, um, yeah, of experimental work, of, uh, of acoustic analysis, I think is, is quite important. When... Um, when you want to make a case to the field that a phenomenon exists, then there is a way to establish it that is independent of your subjective um, uh, observation. And that is, and, and when we're talking about phenomena that, that are typologically rare, that are controversial in a particular theory, then that is, uh, then that is quite important. It makes me think of a of a sentence in um, yeah when we wrote when we wrote up the um, when we wrote up the paper on three level vowel length in Shiluk, we actually essentially some of some of the um, yeah the, there was there was a fair amount of of, of disbelief yeah that about about that this that this could be true and. I think when we are 
contesting what the facts are, then evidence in linguistics, just as in in any other part of life, evidence is uh, is a uh, is a precious commodity. Anyway, so going on to three level vowel length in Shiluk. So what we see there is so Shiluk, just like Dinka, already had the contrast between short and long vowels. And the, the, the long vowels with the suffix, well, with the vocalic suffix, what happened? They became overlong. The thing where Shiluk is different from Dinka is that the short ones that uh, underwent compensatory lengthening, they actually became overlong as well. So um, length, the, the, the morphological lengthening of short roots became over lengthening. I'm gonna, you'll, show, you'll, see that, uh, you'll see that here. So in Shiluk verbs, we find three patterns of alternation. We find short uh, ver verbs that have a short vowel. So this well, means to cut. And if you look at the past tense form, it is distinguished through tone. I'll, I can, I'll play that one. Angol. Again. Angol. Angol. Yeah, so the second one Angol. was low toned. So then we have, then we have uh, short uh, verbs with a short vowel and they lengthen. Which becomes Ajam. in the second singular. And then we Ajam. have long verbs. Akel. And crucially, Akel. when verbs lengthen, they over lengthen. So, oh, sorry. So th this, um, this one and this one, Ajam. they're both over long. Akel. Um, so, and actually, this characteristic goes all through the all through the grammar. So in in nouns as well, we find exactly the same three patterns. We find nouns that are fixed short, like this one, and then oh yes, so this is in a frame talk? in a and the, the target word is in utterance final position. Could you talk? Yeah. Could but, you talk? And then we have the ones that, that lengthen. Could you come? Could you come? And this one as well. Could you get? Yeah. Could you get? Right. So, I mean, yeah, this is the demonstrative, and it also changes the final consonant to a nasal, it changes the tone. But the you, you, you see how the first one did not increase in, in vowel length and the other two did. And so the, the key issue between short and long, therefore in Shiluk is in the base form of the paradigm, yeah. right? You also find this in adjectives all through the grammar. We have these three patterns of length alternation. There are also suffixed uh, nouns. And there, weirdly enough, we see the opposite. And with that, I mean, is that when when a noun is suffixed, like, the, like these ones, then we see the short level of vowel length in the inflections, the inflections like the demonstrative, and the greater vowel length in the base form. But it's the same pattern yeah, of, uh, uh, of, of alternate, either being fixed short or alternating between long and overlong, or finally alternating, uh, sorry, alternating between short and overlong, or alternating between long and overlong. I'll play these ones as well. Kadepeja. Kadepeña. Kadepal. Kadepal. Kadeboda. Kadebone. So that is how the uh, yeah how the vowel length works in the uh, in the in the morphology of nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So we wanted to test this, 
and um, yeah, this is this is the our uh, uh, yeah the the final version of the paper, and actually this study is the one. Um, it's actually a study that um, yeah before showing you these these data i would like to to tell you or where this comes from because you i don't know at the end um it got published but the when the first time that i collected data on this phenomenon was on in a 2000 uh 2009 yeah so 2009 so i collected three-way minimal uh so, yeah so uh, three-way minimal sets for vowel length with nine people in Khartoum and um afterwards I did the acoustic analysis but I realized that the tones within the sets were not the same tone was a confound and so um what what did I do well Four years later, I think, I had again the opportunity to collect new data on this. And by then, I knew the tone system of Shiluk better. So and this was in South Sudan, and I, I again collect uh, data from, from eight or nine people. And afterwards, I realized again that there was a confound, because I had learned more about the tone system in the meanwhile, but there were still, I realized there was still a tone, a difference in tone. So what I'm showing you here is the data set I collected in 2016. And there are no confounds in here. So um, I don't know, why do I say this? Because um, I think it is valuable to play the long game. Sometimes you don't figure something out the first time. And well, if you're a bit stupid like me, then you don't, then you still get it wrong a few more times. But um, let the data trickle in, uh, and then at some point it does, uh, it does make sense. Anyway, so the, because yes, as I as I argue here, you've got three-way um, minimal pairs for um, for vowel length. Uh, sorry, minimal sets for vowel length, and notice the tone is the same. Uh, so I do feel a sort a little bit of proud for that over that. So we're going I'm going to play you some. So the tone in this data. So how is it structured? Well, you see there are there are four vowels here, e, a, o, and u. And in for each of those, I have here. Uh, you see here two two minimal sets. So two minimal sets with e, two with a. To with o, to with u, the tone is completely the same, no difference. The syllable structure is completely the same, no difference. And so this is, and the words are recorded uh, in utterance medial position. Yeah, so I'll play them. <laughs> Uh, or if I play this one, uh, or yeah, that all again, that all again, that all again. So, very clearly, these are monosyllabic, these are all monosyllabic forms. Yeah, um, they are all elicited in utterance medial position. Um, Position in utterance is a very important uh, factor in the study of vowel length because of final lengthening. If a, if a syllable is in utterance final position, it will increase greatly in uh, duration as a, as a consequence. So this means that either we want to get, get all of the words in utterance medial position, or we want to get them in utterance final position, but not no that you can't uh yeah that would be a bad confound to uh to leave in let me play you this set the dupe the dupe the dupe 
um, yeah, you see that the context is, is the same in terms of tone. So the following word always has a low tone, but it is not exactly the same word. The reason for that is that this inflection, uh, I told you that uh, for many nouns, we get the short grades in the base form and we get the lengthened form in the inflected form. Uh, in, uh, in the inflections, that is the case here. And this inflection, so this is a, a form of the paradigm of this word. This inflection is what is, you could call it, if you're familiar with the study of languages that have case of with genitive, this is what, what's sometimes been called anti-genitive. Imagine if in the marking of a possessive noun phrase, you inflect not on the possessor, but on the possessed. So with a genitive, you mark it on the possessor. In this thing, which I call, which is called pertensive, you mark it on the possessed term. Um, and so that's why here the rodent of people, it will be rodent that inflects. And the inflection means I've got a possessor with me. Yeah. Whereas we're used to seeing genitive where the where the possessor would be marked anyway right um so this is the the data set and so this we collected with eight native speakers of um uh, of shillock and we see exactly the same kind of pattern uh, that i showed you earlier uh, on the basis of dinka so short um, short, long, and overlong is marked here. And you see there is a fairly good separation between the levels. Uh, the, the values are really quite similar as in Dinka. So 70, uh, 70, 114, and 150, those are typical values of short, long, and overlong vowels in utterance medial position. Of course, if we have final lengthening on top of it, well, it's actually quite interesting what final lengthening does. So I haven't studied that systematically in Shilluk, but what you find that is that there is actually an interaction between the three level vowel length contrast and final lengthening in such a way that the short vowels, they don't lengthen much in as a function of final lengthening. But the long ones the, does some, and the overlong ones does does even more. So it is almost like, uh, well, one um, interpretation is that this one can lengthen, but it can't lengthen too much, or it gets in the way of this one. Yeah, that the um, that is uh, uh, that is one analysis. Anyway, so. Um, when you do this type of work, uh, I told you earlier on that the um, that Odin and Prain in those surveys of hypothesized cases of three level fouling, that they said that, well, most of these hypothesized cases, we can actually reanalyze as involving another dimension of contrast. So one thing that I wanted to, uh, th that, I, that was quite important in this context was not just to measure vowel duration, but also to measure other phonetic uh, parameters. So as to see whether there could be anything else going on. And, that, and, and you see that here. Uh, I mean, what I'm showing you is the results of linear um, discriminant analysis, so or LDA. Um, L, so imagine that, imagine that the contrast is really clear. Yeah, imagine that, um, yeah, that that a low tone has has a value of a hundred hertz for a speaker, and a high tone has two hundred hertz. Well. If you would, if an algorithm needs to automatically say whether it's short or long, it's going to get that correct 100% of the time. But when 
these values are overlapping, yeah, when there when there is an overlap between the distributions, then in some cases it will get it right, and in some cases it won't uh, get it right. That is the kind of results that we see here. So, for example, let's look here at F0. Um, uh, we are dealing here, excuse me, for bus 5. It does it every 10 minutes, uh, passing through Edinburgh here. Um, right, so when we have, um, if, we, if we look here at F0, uh, there you see a measurement of, uh, of F0 at the midpoint of the vowel. I think it was more, more a mean value over the central section of it. And you see that uh, if you ask the algorithm to produce, to classify short, long, and overlong vowels on the basis of the F0 value, then it is really guessing. Yeah, it is getting it, it is getting it really, uh, this, this horizontal dotted line is chance level. And because the classification is between three options, chance level means getting it right one in three, yeah, 33%. And so if you give the algorithm the F0 information, it goes a bit above it, but we really still at chance. And if we give it uh, vowel quality information, F1 and F2, then we are still not very, uh, not very far. If we give it the duration of the coda consonant, then yeah, then it goes up a bit, because that one uh, is as the vowel as the vowel duration increases uh, with greater levels of vowel length the duration of the coda actually decrease is, is proportionally sh shorter. So the, the, the short ones that have, uh, excuse me, that, yeah, uh, the ones that, no, I'm, I'm gonna go, go back to the data to, uh, so the P, for example, will be slightly longer here, will be longest here, shorter here, and a bit shorter still here, yeah? But, that difference in the duration of the coda consonant is a lot smaller and less consistent than the difference in the duration of the vowel. So, um, so because based on, on vowel duration by itself with nothing else, we're already at 96% correctly classified. Yeah. Um, and this is, as I and I say it again, this is based on the raw values. Um, actually, no, I sorry, I can't remember. I can't be sure whether this was on the raw values or whether here it was a transformed. Um, yeah, um, because for because I know that for these other measurements you would have to z transform it. So I probably would have done it the same here as well. Anyway, so. Um, if we throw in all of the measures together, then yeah, then correct classification goes up a little more. But really, this vowel duration is doing the business for this contrast more than any of these other ones. Yeah, that is what we see. That is what we see here. So there is a there is a related issue here about um, what is yeah, one, one analysis that, um, that has been given in relation to the Dinka phenomenon is, is one that um, by Jerry Dimendal, who argued that, well, I, I told you that in, in Dinka, the alternation is always between, between short and long or between long and overlong. And Gerrit Dimendal, sorry, he argued that, well, then we only need two levels of vowel length at the lexical level, because every noun or every verb will be appear with short, 
with a short vowel or with a long vowel in some forms of its paradigm. Um, and it is the same in, in, uh, in Shilok. Remember that I showed you that, um, that uh, when we looked at the data here, yes, that you've got nouns that are sh have a short vowel and those that have a long vowel. And Gerrit Dimendal's point was, well, we don't have to postulate three levels of vowel length. <coughs> Apologies. Because there, because the third level of vowel length is never lexical. Yes. We don't, you, you always have, if a noun appears with an overlong vowel somewhere, well, it appears with a short or a long vowel somewhere else. Um, now, and in that sense, uh, Shilluk is interesting because there are some, uh, because yeah, with, that is indeed the case for, for most uh, Shilluk words. But here are some verbs that um, are only overlong. Yeah, these are these are verbs that um, um, yeah that there is nowhere in their paradigm do we see them with a short vowel or with a long vowel. The reason for this is that um, that presumably these are derived paradigms. Uh, so Shilluk has a very rich morphology, <coughs> and one. Uh, derivation is for um, is for spatial orientation <clears throat> and telicity, so uh, an event having an endpoint, and and the, that is I think what is what is going on here. So yeah, these are presumably derived paradigms, but there is no source paradigm anymore. <clears throat> so we don't have any grounds to postulate um, an underlying representation with a short vowel or with a long vowel. Um, the evidence isn't there. So based on what we, on the available evidence, we should say that these underlyingly have an overlong vowel. <coughs> and so in that sense, these data are quite interesting because um, we we cannot say in in so in Dinka we can say that um, three level vowel length is limited to the surface phonology, and in the underlying phonology we just have short versus long. In Chiluk we cannot say that uh, there is uh, there are some forms where where we sh where and they are actually also not just f function morphemes, but lexical morphemes where we should, uh, where the data compel us to represent them uh, with uh, as lexically, uh, lexically overlong. <coughs> so um, to, in my view, this uh, hypothesis of ternary vowel length is corroborated for, 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 uh, uh, both for Tinka and also for Shilluk. And then uh, this is the <coughs> the most the most um, appropriate phonological representation in my view of these forms. So by uh, representing the difference in vowel duration, uh, in terms of phonological uh, phonological weight units, that is what we would do if this were a binary contrast. And I think that the only reason not to do it would be um, if if we like binarity so much that we're willing to look for a way around it. And ways around it, what could that be? I've I've heard that 
well, in, in, in discussing these phenomena with, um, with, with other linguists, that people are ready to sacrifice the syllable for binarity. So by saying that, well, what if we say that these forms are, uh, that this is a trisyllabic form and this is a disyllabic form? And for me, I would, that looks like a bad deal to me because then we, then we are gutting the syllable. Yeah, the syllable becomes in a way like the mora. So the mora is an abstract weight unit. And then we kind of um, using the syllable as an abstract weight unit. But the syllable is not abstract. The syllable has phonetic reality. So that's why it seems like a bad deal to me. Anyway, that brings me to the um, to the end of this uh, of the uh, yeah date what I wanted to present on uh, on Dinka. Um, and now I would, I would like to come to the uh, didactic part, and uh, in, in and what I will do here is just in case Prat is unfamiliar to you, this software that is widely used for phonetic uh, acoustic analysis, I'm gonna go just briefly uh inter introduce you to it in a way in case you've never used it before i i am aware that with this type of stuff everybody has different levels so in case uh, so this may if you're familiar with Prat, this will be too too basic for you i won't take too long um and as i said i have this this exercise prepared that uh um, but yeah, when you open software that you've never used before, it can be a bit like, what am I seeing? So I would like to, to do that, uh, that with you. Right. So um, in this study, this is based on, on uh, segmented speech in Dinka and in Shiluk. And so <coughs> segmentation, that means putting markers at the boundaries between the segments. And we need that for duration when we're in, like in this study, but it's also uh, important in relation to other measurements. So if you're actually interested in vowel quality, well, you still need to know the domain of the vowel and you need to segment because that's the only way you, you're gonna get the, uh, the duration value. So what I'm gonna do now is um, uh, I'll get, uh, I, and I think I need to, I might need to get out of my presentation because otherwise I can't open Praat. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, well, I'm going to go back to, to uh, screen sharing. Let me do that. Share screen. And yeah, I'll do it this way. Right now, I'm just sharing my, my my whole screen, so you can just see see anything, and that makes it easier to to go between windows. When you open Prat, this is what you see. You see these two windows appearing, and that can be a bit already like, yeah, what is what what's that what's that about? Well, this window here. Uh, what's called the, the picture window you only need it to make graphs so there's no it's not particularly relevant most of the time uh, this is the window that does matter um, the Prat ob objects window and so when we open a sound file you'll go to open read from file uh, don't worry you don't have to, uh, um, if this is new to you like uh, no need to to make notes because as i said all of this is uh, uh, i have step by step instructions that just talk you through this so i mean talk you through they're written but you, well you know what i mean um, um, and so if we take a, a sound file and i'll take one of the exercises i'll take this uh, this one um, it appears here and then we can, for example, click view and edit, and then we get to we get to see it. This looks a bit weird because I was uh, looking at the spectrogram in a different way. So I'm just going to go to standards. Yes, that's better. Um, so this is the 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 sentence. One of the sentences. Well, we see. We see the waveform at the top, 
at the bottom we see the spectrogram but also lots of other things like this this yellow line is the intensity i'm gonna turn it off the uh the blue thing is the f0 i'm gonna turn that off and then we see the formants i'm gonna turn those off as well um because when you segment it is about and um so yeah uh, it's about putting in these markers and how do you do that i'm taking you there so uh f when you have a sound object here you can click annotate and then you can click to, to text grid then when you click to text grid this is perhaps something weird um, you see here, Mary, John, Bell, which of these are pointiers? Bell, what is that about? So, um, Prat will create a text grid with as many tiers as there are here, chunks of speech separated by uh, spaces. So, if I have here segments, I get, I get one tier. If I have, for example, segments, gloss, translation, then I get, then I get three tiers. Yeah. Um, the point tiers, well, then you don't have intervals. Anyway, in, in this case, I would go, for example, for segments, just one tier. And if I click OK, that appears here. Now, the, the text grid is simply a text file. It does not have the sound. So if I open it alone, well, there's nothing in there now. But then how do we do the segmentation? Well, we we select these two things together. And then if we then open them, then we see the waveform, the spectro, spectrogram, and then below it here, the segmentation. Oh, what did I wrong? Closing this. Yeah. Right. If we do the segmentation, it's always worthwhile give yourself a good view so i would always kind of make the window big because it's very much based on your on your visual uh, visual information so this is one of these uh, these shilluk sentences so i can say okay here is the end of the vowel here is the beginning of the vowel and i can do it just um, and I can simply keep going and do this for the whole thing. This is the, the, the P. And uh, you, you are, what are we looking for here? And here I'll go back to my presentation. Um, how do you place the boundaries? Well, we are looking in, in putting these boundaries, we're looking for evidence of changes in constriction in the vocal tract yeah or at the uh, at the laryngeal settings um and um uh, i have included in the materials that are available for this um for this presentation a paper by uh turk sugahara and nakai and in which they in which they explain this so sometimes well, very long ago, I, I don't know, I, uh, I, yeah, doing my PhD in, in the 90s, we actually learned to do this primarily on the waveform, yeah? These days, when people learn it, they learn it primarily on the spectrogram. I would say use everything, yeah? So, for example, here, if we have this, we have here the word PAL, uh, if we want to, to see where does the vowel end and where does the, co the, the coda consonant begin, one thing is we can say, okay, here, this is where the formants suddenly get a lot less energy in the, spect in the spectrogram. You see here the F1, here is the F2. At this point, the energy be suddenly becomes a lot weaker. We could put the marker there. Yeah. However, it is equally fine to say here we see the waveform envelope and here there is a there is a discontinuity 
in the envelope of the waveform. Very often a nasal or an L will, a bit, will be a bit like an arrowhead, yes? Uh, that it kind of and and the end of the of the of the of the arrow the the head of it there you can that's also kind of often a, a good information and of course these two things are exactly at the same point uh, well of course um, that's important in some cases they are not at exactly the same point so it is important that we have articulated a protocol. Like, this is the first thing that I look at. This is the second thing that I look at, etc. Anyway, we can go on like this. And um, of course, when you do an acoustic study, um, which materials that you put in it has gonna, has gonna have a big impact on how easy the data are to work with. So for example, if you want, a, if you want detailed, information about uh, the duration of segments of like vowel length well in the data set that i showed you with those with those um, um let's see yeah in this data set none of these target words none of them have a semi-vowel yeah and the reason for that is because semi-vowel are just a can of worms when you want to segment them. There is no, in, in semi-vowels, you will never have a sharp discontinuity. So your, your measurements are gonna get, gonna be more messy. Now, in some cases, we, we have no choice. Imagine that in examining the Shilluk sound system, I would have only found minimal pairs with semivowels. Well, I would have taken them, but if you can, then it's really worthwhile to, to avoid them. Anyway, so here we, we, we're, we're going on and um, here we are. Um, now, if in this situation, uh, if I, oh yes, and we can use phonetic, phonetic characters here. Uh, you see there, I'm, I, if I do backslash I C, then I get small cap I. And similarly here at the end, if I, this is the, the new, and uh, here I need to move the window a bit. Uh, backslash and J gives me a new. Yeah, that type of stuff. Uh, yeah, let me just finish, complete this. Key and backslash EF. Yeah. So in general, I recommend to segment as little as you can get away with. And with that, I mean, is if I'm never, if I know in advance that I'm not going to make a measurement here that I'm only going to make measurements here in my target word, then it makes a lot of sense to only segment the target word. And actually, if I can know from my file name that this is SPAL, I might actually just do it onset nucleus coda. Yeah. And I wouldn't have any of any of this. I would just leave that, leave that all out because and this is quite important. Um, there are there are situations. There are situations in which we want to make. Uh, I'll just first get there with my slides. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So. Um, yeah. Um, there are situations in which we want to make. A rich, a rich annotation in a documentary context. Yes. So when I'm, of course, when I'm when I'm doing text analysis in Shilluk, then I'll be using. Uh, well, I still use Prat for that, but then I will have a rich array of tiers that have information about the phonology, the morphology, the translation, the orthography, comments, the the works. Um, so it's very, and of course that is. That is a yeah, very valuable um, work. 
um, when you're doing an experimental study, you are not making, um, well, the material doesn't need to be accessible in that way because you will write, it's, well, it's still important to, to make it publicly available. I agree with that. But you can, um, it, it is worthwhile to limit how much you type because you'll get more errors uh, if, you, uh, if you type more. And the information can be extracted in, in other ways. So, um, so that is what I'm saying here. Uh, keep the annotation for an acoustic study minimal. And of course, I'm not saying that, that it's like that for a, uh, a documentary corpus, but for an acoustic study, I think it's, uh, there's no need, for example, to, for me to, in that, in da this data set, there is no need for me to, to put, to specify in the segmentation that they all have a high tone. I know that, yeah. So um, keep it keep it minimal, yeah. When it comes to uh, to doing this, right? And so yeah, if you if you're interested in uh, practicing with this, then you could uh, you could uh, use that exercise. What what will you see in it? You will see uh, if it's a zip file, and this is what it includes. It has six sound files, so it has a, a three a three member minimal set for vowel length in uh, uh, in Shilluk and by each of two speakers, speaker one and speaker two. And then you have got some step-by-step -step instructions there to um, that, that simply, uh, yeah, tell, uh, explain to you how you, uh, how to do this. Yeah, and that's uh, me at the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you. There are uh, so many, uh, for me, it's complex things uh, to see, yeah? And also interesting how to look at your data and how vowel length can mark morphological uh, construction in Siluk or Dinka. And for me, um, you know, uh, vowel length is, uh, it's a hard uh, thing to analyze, maybe because I'm not a real phonologist, you know, but we have to do uh, phonology analysis for our work sometime. And um, with tonal language, it's also a challenging thing to do in phonology. And as you quote just now, so I quote from you just now that um, maybe it is, uh, you know, it is, uh, simpler when 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 we find uh, you know foul sequence in 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 a word then the tendency we do is uh, you know to separate uh, those uh, sequence into more than one syllable and uh, from you we learn uh, at least I learned that of course it is challenging to decide that um, two or three uh, vowel sequence, yeah, in this case, the same vowel belongs to one unit of syllable. And that's why um, then we have a short vowel and then we have long vowel and over length uh, of a long vowel as your analysis for uh, Dinka or Silo. So, um, yeah, and for a uh, question and answer, there are so already many questions for you, Bert, in the in the chat column. Uh, for for yeah, for long questions, then let me just invite. Um, I don't know whether it's a Mister or a Miss uh, Miss Lily um, Miss Lily. Uh, wait a minute, uh, Lily M Rusman. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, Miss Lily. Lily, please. Hi, yeah. Right <laughs> what a surprise. Good to see yes, you. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, do I have to read my question by myself? Uh, or you, you just can directly ask uh, Bert. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, please. I just want to um, read. But, because it's, uh, I write it uh, 
at the beginning of your uh, presentation, so I, I don't know what I write here. I just want to read it out. Uh, just a minute. That, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking because I'm looking in the chat yes. and I don't see well, it I, yet. I so, write it uh, oh, oh, special right. for um, Miss Luhan. Yes, I see it now. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, yeah, you're asking, um, so the accents show different tones. Is that, yes? Uh, um, so the first question would be, uh, sorry to interrupt, no, is the duration contrast in Arabic uh, the same? same? Have you ever right. heard about yeah. that, about yeah. the Arabic? Yeah, so um, one thing that I find in relation to um, to, to, to Arabic is that you often in Arabic hear also a difference in vowel quality. Yes. So that, um, uh, I, I don't think so. so the, only have three uh, vowels. Yes, but, but what I mean is that, for example, I might hear, for example, something like safar, safar. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that and and that the the that, that long a might have a slightly different um, quality than in safarta. Yeah, the the, the initial a that yes. I I'm not and and so so I would say yes, it is the same thing mm -hmm. in Arabic. Um, the the what we do find is that in in phonetics, almost mm -hmm. every almost every contrast will have secondary correlates. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, like that have a that are kind of there in a supporting role, but they are not doing. And and the question is when we are deciding is this vowel quality, or is this vowel length? That is why I think that doing the linear discriminant analysis can be so useful, because we can really see which phonetic parameter is doing most of the work. Okay. Well, I have never heard about the um, uh, contrast in vowel quality in Arabic. Uh, I just know that uh, they have uh, duration contrast in Arabic. But they, they have now, what? I don't know. They only have uh, duration contrast in Arabic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely... About, um, different uh, vowel quality. Uh, so you know, in 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 speech, everything hangs together. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we make if we produce a vowel over over short, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, maybe there is a misunderstanding here because I want to make clear I'm completely I'm I'm with you that Arabic has a vowel length contrast. Mm -hmm. Yes. The the, the only thing. That, uh, what I'm saying is that, and the and the primary correlate will be vowel duration, yeah. undoubtedly. Yes. yes? Yeah. Um, what I'm saying is that when you make a measure uh, a phenomenon aside from the primary correlate, you will find mm -hmm. other other correlates almost always, and okay. and when it, and in and in a vowel length contrast very often it will be that when the duration is short the that the, the uh, that is time pressure and the mouth will not open completely so we get slight centralization okay. it is not a big effect yeah. but um it is it, it is there uh, actually while we speak i can i will get some some data to to uh, to to show this and then i can i hope this goes quickly. okay i understand what you mean so it's like a micro prosody so the uh, yeah yeah i mean it's it's just a matter that uh yeah that everything in speech influences mm -hmm. oh yes i'm i've got it here so i will um i will share screen again uh to to show you uh this is Okay, does this work? Yep, okay. So what I would 
we're going here to measurements of vowel quality in Dinka. Mm -hmm. And in this graph here, you see that the, and I need to go slightly up. Yes, the, 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 the open circles are the short vowels. Yeah. And you see that the short vowels are slightly centralized. Yes. Yeah. And that is the that is the kind of thing that I mean. Now, mm -hmm. most yeah. of the contrast is is yeah. is done by uh, the duration, but vowel quality is a secondary correlate, you would say. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I understand. And that is where the li the yeah. linear discriminant the, the discriminant analysis can can be useful. Okay. Okay. That's clear. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, in relation to your other question, the accents were indeed showing a lexical yeah. tone. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think this uh, similar question comes from Miss Mirna. Where uh, she uh -huh. also wants to know uh, whether or not accent show different tones. Yeah, so uh, the, the Shiluk language has a total of nine different contrastive melodies. So whereas, for example, in Mandarin, uh, the best known tone language, we've got four lexical categories. Well, we know that um, there are some language. Dinka, for example, also has four, just like Mandarin. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in Shiluk, uh, we have nine. And one thing of them is that four of those nine categories are, um, are falling tones. So there are four different falling tones. And that is why in some of my transcriptions, you will see more than one diacritic on, on the same syllable. Uh, so you might wonder, whoa, is that a mistake? No, it's not a mistake. It is just that if you have just one falling tone, then you will just use the falling tone diacritic. But when you've got four, well, then you have to get creative. Then you need to kind of combine them. And so, and what I'm trying to do there is combine something like distinguish between mom, low fall, mom, high fall, mom, high fall to mid, and mom which is the late fall. So that's the puzzle, but it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but I hope uh, this creativity, uh, you know, everybody who read the data can understand what the, uh, you know, what the linguist wants to, to show, right? So for example, you know, we have um, yeah. IPA uh, for, um, what is it, um, for annotation. And then with this uh, diacritic, it's uh, also another challenging thing to, to mark. I, I think that, that is a very important point. And it is a very frustrating point because tone systems are beautiful phenomena. But diacritics are meaningless in communication. Yes. So um, if I transcribe the letter M, then even though you have never heard the language, you will know what I talk about. If, but I, if I put a, a, a tone diacritic on, that, that we, I am not communicating as well. And so the study of tone systems is really hindered by the fact that we need to use abstract diacritics to convey the distinctions. Um, it is something that that troubles me quite a lot because I know that the job is only done for us as linguists when we get the message across. So what I'm doing is with I, I and actually these days I I only submit to journals that allow me to embed sound examples. Mm -hmm. So and because I want to get my message across. So. Um, and some journals are great at that. I, I think phonology is wonderful in that respect. They're very uh, language languages is, is is fine. I think sometimes journals uh, will only make the sound examples available as supplementary materials. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem because I want to communicate with the reader who is slight. I mean, you know, very few people have 
are thinking, oh, I'm going to, I want to know about African languages and I'll, um, so I, I know that when we study a minority language, there is the work to hold on to the reader, the reader who starts reading, not to lose them and to try to hold on to them is an important job. And if they see a sentence full of diacritics and they just have to take my word for it, that's, yeah, and in any case. So yes, I know I'm aware of that problem. And uh, yeah, in, and I think that, that the solution to it is embedded sound examples. Mm -hmm. Because these, in, these uh, diacritics and combination of diacritics, they stand symbol for a melodic shape. And I think we, as a, you want to kind of communicate what that shape is and the only way, yeah, ears, it's, it's, a, it's a hearing thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. but no, you're, you're very right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Okay, now uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Johan, yeah, uh, because he has posted some uh, questions. So if uh, Mr. Johan is here, please. Mm, no, uh, if not, then uh, I'll read the question uh, for you. Yeah. So the first question is how to measure the change of the different. Um, so I have to, to find out the context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, how to measure the change of the different, maybe the vowel length different. And the second question is how to analyze spectrogram. So I think it's a very practical question. Yeah. Mm. So if Mr. Johan is here, um, I invite you to, uh, to ask the question directly. So we, we don't miss the context of, uh, of, you, of what you mean about the change of the different. Yeah, so the um, um, in, in relation to spectral measurements, how do we uh, measure the spectrogram? Um, if that is in relation to, uh, to vowels, then of course we're going to be measuring formants. Yeah, so formants, uh, the F1 um, reflects uh, vowel height, the F2 reflects vowel advancement, and that is, uh, that is something that is way we, we, we can have a handle on that. And that is definitely part of the, as I, as I just showed you the, uh, I just sh showed you a, a vowel plot of, uh, of, of, the, of the Dinka vowels as a function of vowel length. Um, as I said earlier in, in uh, replying to uh, 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 Lily Rosman's uh, question, um, so often phonological contrasts are in a phonetic sense package deals. Yes, you there is a primary correlate, but you've got two or three other ones that are also part of the of the phonetic realization. And so the, those so those spectral measurements will be an important part of the uh, of the analysis. And yeah, and and how you how you do that. So so Prat uh, can also uh, uh, is also very useful for for, uh, for for that type of measurement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another practical question is from uh, Miss Wulansari. Can Prat measure the duration of pauses on words in a long sentence? Yes, that will. So that is that will not be a problem. One challenge that would be. Um, and, and I actually, I think that Prat, Prat has, an, has an algorithm or a function with which you can have it automatically put boundaries in um, when there are big, when there are big uh, silences. Yeah, so that if you've got a big silence within a sentence, or for example, you've got a big recording of a story and you want to have each of those of those utterances marked off 
by um, an interval boundary, Prat can automatically insert those, those boundaries. One area, if you're talking about a detailed work where the duration of a pause is important, one tricky thing, one problem to look out for is what are you what to do with uh, utterances or chunks of utterance that begin with a plosive because with a plosive we've got the sequence of a closure phase and a burst phase now if that closure phase is immediately preceded by a pause it is impossible to tell what the pause is and what the closure phase is of the burst that uh, uh, of the, the closure phase of the plosive that follows it. So that, I guess if, if, it's, if you're doing detailed work, I would say, yes, um, you, it would not be a problem to determine how long the pauses are, but you would not be able to get an accurate measurement uh, in the case of uh, chunks of the utterance of, of or chunks of utterance that begin with a plosive, uh, I mean uh, a voice uh, a voiceless plosive. What about the voiced plosives? Well, there it depends whether the language does pre-voicing. If there is pre-voicing, you would be able to to see where the pre-voicing starts. But you also have languages that have a voicing contrast where it is between. Uh, VOT delay in the case, uh, so our aspiration on the one hand and no aspiration on the other. And there, uh, so yeah, it, so in short, uh, in short, yes, but plosives will be, will be a, an area to, to pay special attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, plosive, we can see from spectrogram, it has a very strong uh, color, right? So, um, okay, uh, another question, it's a bit long, then I'll invite um, Risa Sukma to, um, to ask his question directly. Um, so Risa Sukma, if you're here, I invite you. If not that, uh, then I will... Um, read the question uh, for Risa. Yeah. Are the results of the measurement of power length in the Dinka language always the same? Mm. Um, in the case that there are only three level, is it possible for a speaker to, uh, to pronounce vowels in different lengths? For example, in the first measurement, he pronounces a short vowel and on Another measurement, he pronounced a long vowel in the case of the same pronounced word and same speaker. Can you get a point? Right. So, yeah, <laughs> thank mm. you. Yes, I understand that. So I think it is very important to, to understand that vowel length as a phonological phenomenon um, is not tied up in a, in a, in a hard way with a particular durational range, yes? Similarly, um, if, if, um, yeah, if, if we both speak a tone language, my low tone can be, or well, your low tone could be at the same F0 level as my high tone, and we would still speak the same tone language and we would understand one another perfectly. The reason for that is that we interpret melody, F0, in a relational way, yes? So as soon as I have two syllables from you in speech, I set my range. And I know that, for example, and I can know that this ma, that that might be high for you because it's a lot higher than the previous syllable. So it's important not to interpret vowel length in similarly in the same way. If you hear me speaking like this, then, well, then you know, okay, maybe I hear a really long duration, but it doesn't mean that it is the third level of vowel length. It's just that this guy is speaking super slow, yes? 
and you don't even think about that consciously. You just set your framework of reference uh, like that. And I've, I've had that in the study of, uh, of Dinka that I, at some point I'm making recordings with two ladies and they were both, I think their, yeah, their short vowels had pretty much the durations of other speakers' long vowels. Everything mm -hmm. was longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that does not get in the way of communication and it doesn't challenge the analysis because it's the same with anything in speech. Yeah. I've got, I've got um, like vowel quality data where a speaker has a, has a vowel A ah that has an F1 of 1150 hertz. For a lot of speakers, that's only going to be 850. Yeah. So speech is relational in duration, in, in fundamental frequency, in spectral characteristics. Mm -hmm. And that is why so often we need the Z transformation to, um, to uh, w when we want to put data from different speakers together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we have to know the difference between duration and uh, vowel length, right? So from exactly. your explanation, yes. yeah. Yeah, so my chronological and phonetic. Right. Uh, so my, maybe uh, it uh, cor corresponds to the uh, Risa's question. I also have a, a, a small question for you. So how do you uh, measure the, the average length of uh, vowel length? Let's say like that in uh, the language. Uh, for example, OK, um, uh, the, the average length for short vowel is uh, this much and then for long vowel is this much and for over long vowel is this big for example yeah so i have a i have a rough a rough idea of that that it will be about 70 um well no maybe, maybe 75 um yeah 115 and 150 yeah for short long and over long however um if we have final lengthening, then I would more expect the, the, the overlong vowels to be closer to 200, yes? Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, if vowel height, I would not be surprised if, if a short vowel that has, uh, that is closed, so E or U, when those are in a syllable, are with, are with short vowel length, then it might well be only 50 milliseconds for mm -hmm. the uh, of vowel of, of length. Whereas if the vowel is a, it might be for a short vowel, it might be 85. So by having studied the phenomenon, th this phenomenon for a long time, I have a sense of what is what is probable, what is likely. Um, and one area where I still struggle is when there is a semi-vowel. Mm -hmm. So if the if the code, so you will have seen that in all of those examples that I showed for Chiluk and Dinka, that you always have a closed syllable. So it is always CVC. You saw syllables like lel, dup, pal, yes, ngol. And that is indeed uh, the way the way the um, the lexicon works. Uh, Words in these in these languages are content words, are closed single syllables. Um, one way in which this is very important for this analysis is that um, if they were open syllables, that would give us other ex other possible explanations. We could say, oh, maybe it's lexical stress, or oh, maybe it's um, a different kind of foot type. Yes. Mm -hmm. But they're all single syllables. So that is kind of what makes it really simple. It, it helps to get rid of all kinds of alternative analyses. Yeah, so uh, do you think that there is an average duration for um, vowel length for the whole language? Sure. We, we can always get an average value out. Mm. Um, and yeah, if you just put everything together and that will be about, about 100, yeah, probably. 
I mean, in a controlled context, it will be about a hundred fifty between a hundred and hundred twenty milliseconds. I think. Um, yeah, that. Um, yeah, there's always an average. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so um, there is there is um, uh, another question uh, from uh, Miss Lily. Yeah, um, Bear, can you try saying? Okay, it's hard for me to uh, pronounce it. So I think this this is from Siluk or uh, Dinka just now. Uh, how would you say he? isolate someone and you provoke someone ran a lel or ran a lel uh, because uh, miss lily wants to hear the differences if you can um, pronounce it yes well i think what i would what's probably the the most useful is that if i just play the what is what the speakers do because that is gonna be gonna be more relevant. So, oh, okay. um, sure. I mean, well, I mean, I can say I would say <laughs> Rana Lul. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, so I, I I would say for for the second singular of isolate, I would say Rana Lul, and then for the third singular, it would be Rana Lul. No, sorry, Rana Lil. But you know, like I, I really, why, why do I even try this? Because I mean, I'm not the reference. I'm not the, 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 the reference here. I think so. Uh, um, yeah. So, um, yeah. This is the, the. Uh, let's see, page down. Yep. Here is the minimal set. Rana Lil. Does that play? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, sorry. I'll, I'll start again. So short. Rana lil. Rana lil. Rana lil. And so here you hear the centralization of the short vowel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That the short vowel, and that is that is. So we're looking here at this pair. The short one is this one, and then the overlong one is the let's see lslg is this one and then the other two are uh yeah the, the other three are cl close together so this vowel shows quite a lot of centralization uh. um and and in a way but it's exactly what we expect yeah when you only have 70 milliseconds you can't go all the way to the periphery of the vowel space it's yeah it's not it's not possible still if this if the contrast would be primarily uh one of um of vowel quality then in the linear discriminant analysis that would fall out but it doesn't yeah and also it doesn't work for other vowels look here at o um in the case of o there is not much of an effect of centralization at all all four of them are close together. Yeah. So, um, actually, if you're, yeah, if you're interested in these in these data, uh, actually, while while I answer questions, what I'm going to make available here, if I can, is um, is a file that shows you so the way these language these languages work they have lots of morphology um, but there is it is as if they don't want to add affixes so what does the morphology do the morphology changes vowel length the morphology changes tone the morphology changes even voice quality so breathy voice is also contrastive here uh, and I'll, I'm going to look if I can add a file while, uh, but yeah, we, we, we can just go on and I'll, uh, I'll, look, I'll look for a, an interesting example. I'll tell you about it when I, when I get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Bert, if you don't mind, I would like to invite Prof. Effendi, Prof. Effendi to give us a 
<clears throat> more information about the power uh, length in Arabic. Very good. Prof FND, uh, are you still there? Check it. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. I can hear. Can you hear my voice? Yes, very clear. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, actually, I'm interested in uh, what Bu Lily uh, Rosman asked about uh, the vowel length in, in Arabic. Uh, well, uh, actually, this is interesting when we talk about the uh, standard modern Arabic in uh, Quranic uh, Arabic in in uh, standard Arabic or everyday uh, Arabic used uh, by uh, or Arabic used uh, by people in everyday life. Actually, you have only two distinctions between short and long vowel. But then uh, in, 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 the, in the Holy Quran, uh, there is uh, actually three, three, three distinctions of, of vowel length. For instance, uh, in the word, uh, the word uh, ja'a, ja'a, meaning he came. Uh, uh, actually, the word, the word ja'a or already uh, means he came. If you say uh, ja'a, Ahmad, meaning Ahmad came. But then uh, when it is uh, in the Quran, and then you have the word like uh, ja'a, when you have the glottal stop uh, preceded by a uh, long vowel, and then the, the vowel is uh, actually, the, the, the right reading is uh, like five times length. There's, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in in the in the surah, which is uh, very very familiar to uh, all the Muslims, like Iza Jaa Nasrullahi Bal Fathu, when uh, this is uh, read in the tartil way or read in the uh, following the tajwid or following the uh, correct pronunciation of the Quran, we 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 we, we have to read it. Iza ja nasrullahi. That's in everyday language. Ja a Muhammad, ja a Ahmad, ja a Ali, meaning uh, Ahmad came or Ali came or Muhammad came. But then uh, in the Quran, Iza ja a nasrullah. This is very, very, very long. Uh, for instance, uh, okay, the Muslims, when you are listening to uh, the Surah Al-Fatiha, the end of the Surah, the, the last verse of Al-Fatiha, when they say, Walad Dolin. So that is the, 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 the length in Arabic. Yes. Uh, I would distinguish that we have the everyday Arabic and Quranic Arabic, but then uh, I, when, when you <laughs> supposing you, you ask me for the, the question, though, so what is, uh, what is the what is the reason? Uh, I, I think I think what, what I know is that uh, the th there is there is the saying of the prophet that uh, when you read the Quran you have to to give the best reading you can and then uh, scholars in the Islamic world they okay of course uh, many ages ago they design uh, say, say uh, the accurate pronunciation of the Quran called the Ilmu Tajwid. So Ilmu Tajwid is the accurate pronunciation of how to, to read the Quran, including the including the length. I think that is what I can say about mm -hmm. about, the, about, about the length of, of mm -hmm. uh, Ja'a and Ja'a between, between standard Arabic and Quranic Arabic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor FND. So it's it's also a new uh, knowledge for me yeah, uh, that the standard Arabic is uh, pronounced differently with the uh, Quranic Arabic. Thank you for your explanation. Oh, and okay, okay. Uh, but we we still have one other question. So um, it's from Adventura Lawa Matak. Uh, 
Yeah, so I think this is the last question um, regarding the time. So um, the question is, does Dinka has their own orthography system? Uh, yes, it does. And um, I mean, on the whole, um, the, uh, and, and that is a fairly recent phenomenon. So the Dinka orthography goes back, was created in the 1990s. And um, yes, the, um, it, it, it's quite striking that uh, these are languages that have uh, Dinka and its closely related languages that have between a million, two million, two and a half million speakers. Um, but until even, even now, the, there, so there is an orthography and one, uh, but there are a variety of problems with it. And some of it, some of these problems are simply practical in that South Sudan is not a well-functioning state and so is not delivering uh, primary education in an effective way. But there are also linguistic challenges to it. So earlier on, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Mayani, you, you asked me, uh, you, you pointed out the challenge of, for example, transcribing tone. And when tone has a very important role in the morphology of a language, then in order to explain it, we need to be able to refer to it. And of course, there is that abstraction that gets in the way, that makes it difficult. Um, that gets compounded by the fact that tone is a very unstable thing. Stress is stable. Yeah? So if you look at dialects of English, all of them have in project is a noun in every dialect of English. Project is a verb in every dialect of English. But when you think of intonation systems, they grow all over the place. They kind of, they don't stay put. And it's the same with tone. Now, if tone is doing lots of work in the morphology, it's going to be very difficult to, and it grows apart in different dialects. Some dialects have three tones, some have four tones, some have all kinds of different. Uh, if you look in journals in, uh, uh, that are about phonology, you read a lot of papers about tone. Why are there so many papers about tone? Just because tone is a very complicated thing and it does in the phonologically very complicated things. And so, yes, it's, um, it makes orthography, uh, it's, a, it's a problem for, for orthography, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, but thank you very much for your um, presentation today and uh, sharing knowledge in the uh, discussion session. So um, I think um, the session is enough for today because uh, it's almost uh, four. Uh, okay, it's almost four in Indonesia. And I think you, you said that you still have another meeting after this uh, session. So uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for being here with us today and spending your time to, um, to share uh, your knowledge on phonetic phonology uh, in this uh, uh, online class for uh, Masyarakat Linguistic Indonesia. And to all participants, I would like to uh, thank you all once again for joining us uh, in this session. If you still have further questions for Beth, I think it is okay uh, for us, Beth, to share your uh, contact for yeah. all the attendees uh, here. So yeah. um, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'll share it in the chat box later on, or maybe Mbak Rosa will help us to share your contact for all the attendees who are interested to talk to you um, more deeply on this uh, matter. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and stay healthy and strong in this uh, situation, and hope to see you again in another uh, event from Masyarakat Linguistic Indonesia. Thank you very much and good afternoon to you all and good um, morning, I think, uh, for you, Beth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much.